Welcome to uh, Landmark Chambers webinar on adult social care everyone. This is the second of four adult social care webinars that we're running and today we're covering service changes and closures, um, adults with education, health and care plans and judicial review practice and procedure. The next adult social care webinar is on the 30th of July and the final one is on the 6th of August and details of what's going to be covered are on the Landmark website. So we're, we're all obviously really happy to see so many of you joining the session today and we hope you find it useful and informative. So just to begin with, there are a few housekeeping points. Um, your microphones are automatically muted so you won't have to adjust your settings locally to, to, to bring that about. And your videos have been automatically turned off but if you've if you've turned them on can you please turn them off because it helps with the uh it helps with the uh how well it how well it comes across interference and, and such like um you're very welcome to uh submit questions throughout the session that would be great if you can do that and please submit them in the in the chat section send them via text in the chat section which will be at the top or the bottom of your screen and we'll what we'll try to do is answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations and if there are any that we're not able to answer we'll uh, follow them up after the event. Uh, the, the webinar is going to be uh, recorded and both the slides and the recording are going to be updated to our website. Uh, if your connection is lost at any point during the webinar please just click on the original link once more and you should be able to, to join us. So, um, my name is uh, Steve Naffler and I'm joined by Fiona Scolding QC and Hafsa Masu and Ben Fulbrook. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them by way of introduction later on. But right now, as I'm the first speaker this afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, service changes and closures. So, um, right, well I, I can tell you, uh, because, because I've done it, uh, this topic would usually take about a day to cover properly, whereas I've got 15 minutes. So what follows is going to be um, quick and bullet pointy. All the unanswered questions can be found answered in this in this marvelous tome um, uh, adult social care law which i and other people at landmark have written or or this marvelous tome my friend luke clement's book uh, also published by by lag so you kind of think of this as a checklist with some useful pointers i hope along the way and these are the four main topics so um, as far as concerns budgets, these are the topics I'm going to look at in relation to budgets. Um, and the first issue is, is this, is, as you'll know, many budgets comprise pretty high level decisions about budgetary allocation. And the premise of such budgets may well be that particular services or tranches of services will change or close as a result of the high level budget where the final decision about that is left expressly or implication to be made later on down the line for example by the cabinet so in cases like that in general the courts require only that the council undertakes an adequate high level form of scrutiny of the underlying service proposals for example a relatively broadly expressed discharge of the public sector equality duty will usually suffice. In terms of consultation, it's been held that there isn't a generally a duty to consult at all on the general budget, but if you do, a high level uh, consultation is generally uh, sufficient. Can a budget itself be irrational? Well, some people would say, well, of course. Uh, the, the type of challenges uh, based on, on, on these type of um, considerations set out here um, you know, we've seen lots of them in the past, 
not a single one, I think, has as yet uh, succeeded. Um, the answer is twofold. One is that finance officers are actually quite good at um, setting budgets. And the other answer is that the, the other reason is that the super weapons free approach applies to this kind of high level budget setting. So if the public authority acts within the four corners of the act, uh, it's not going to be able to challenge on the grounds of irrationality short of the extremes of bad faith, improper motive or manifest absurdity. So um, can discrete parts of a budget be quashed? Um, well, one case uh, says uh, no, and uh, another case says yes. Now, uh, and I think I mean, the practical importance of the issue arises in the context of the all singing or dancing budget that is a budget that makes uh, that in addition to sort of setting the broad financial parameters for the next financial year actually makes final decisions that particular services are going to change or close for budgetary reasons and the argument has been made by various local authorities that because of various complex provisions in the local government finance act 1992 the only relief that the court can grant if it considers that a budget calculation is unlawful in some respect, is to quash the entire budget. That might seem like a bit of an extreme argument from a local authority inviting disaster, but the local authority submission that then follows, which can be quite compelling, is that it would be grossly disproportionate and chaos inducing to, to quash the whole budget. So the courts shouldn't do so. And then the contentious bit of the budget will then get through. Um, uh, but as I say, more recent cases have decided that you you can uh, quash parts of the budget. Uh, the issue hasn't been decided at court of appeal uh, level, but for what it's worth, my view is that you probably can quash parts of the budget. Uh, the all singing, all dancing budget, again, is the kind of budget which um, actually makes final decisions about particular uh, services. Um, it's generally implicit that uh, what appears to be a final decision is still going to be contingent on individual assessments of service users in due course. But leaving that aside, anyone who wants to challenge that aspect of a budget, a final decision in relation to a particular service, can usually do so in all the different ways that you can challenge particular decisions to, to, to close or change particular services which is something that's going to be looked at um, shortly in this talk. Um, legal parameters, um, lawyers involved in this kind of area, whether they're advising the local authority, families, commercial interests or whatever, need to think about these particular uh, key parameters, obviously, legislation, guidance, policies. In terms of legislation, um, it's not always easy to assemble all the relevant legislation, especially in children's social care cases, but it, it does need to be done. And its effect, the effect of the legislation needs to be explained to decision makers. They need to properly take it into account. They need to understand it properly. And of course, they need to act within its uh, boundaries. So guidance as well, you've got, um, you, one obviously has to assemble the the statutory guidance, which is an adult, which in an adult social care case is going to be the care and support statutory guidance under Section 78 of the Care Act. So that has to be acted under, which means that the authorities have to act in substantial accordance with it, but can otherwise diverge for good reason. Local authorities uh, you obviously have to find out what other relevant guidance there might be that bears on a particular decision. That has to be taken into account, which means it has to be properly understood. Uh, one can't act deliberately contrary to it, or one has to have a good reason for diverging uh, from it. Um, so then policies, the local authority's own policies need to be, need to be considered. As you'll know, under the CARE Act, there are duties, discrete duties to publish a whole raft of strategies and policies, 
the overarching duty is under the um, Health and Social Care Act 2012, where you have the uh, Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and strategies, and they will usually have to be taken into account in the context of, sort of most decisions involving service changes and closures. Otherwise, in terms of um, local authority policies, local authorities, individuals, sorry, will generally have a legitimate expectation that their particular cases will be decided upon in accordance with any policy that applies to them, and that policy will be made within whatever overarching policy framework there is. If there are problems in that regard, the local authority will have to consider changing a policy that impinges in some way adversely on the, 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 the sort of new changes, new closures that it means to that it means to make. And that will usually entail a process of consultation of its own, discharge of the public sector equality duty, and so forth. So um, there are next a, a sort of series of discrete issues that uh, usually arise in the context of um, service changes and closures, which I'm going to sort of flag up and address um, again relatively speedily. Um, advanced individual assessments, I think the slide is probably pretty explanatory in general. Um, when a local authority is considering changing or closing a service, it, it doesn't have to carry out individual assessments of all the service users who might be affected. It can do various things. It can um, have some sample assessments carried out, or it can just operate on the basis of a reasonable understanding of the levels of need of those individuals and what alternative provision might be available to meet those needs. It's only exceptional in the type of case referred to in that second bullet point, that individual assessments of everyone affected um, have to be carried out. Another uh, bar, potential bar to change are home for life promises. Um, I mean, there was a period of time when local authorities and health authorities quite often promised people that they'd have a home for life in a particular care home or that a particular service would be provided for life. And this was usually given as an assurance to people on the basis that they moved from one care home to another or one service to another without protest or, or litigation on the basis that, that wherever they moved to would be forever. So um, one doesn't, that those kind of promises aren't really made very much these days, but one does still come across them in practice. And this um, slide here encapsulates what the uh, legal approaches where it's asserted that such promises have been have been made. Um, next, um, consultation, um, a, you know, a really interesting topic that could easily take an hour or so. All of these issues, which I would would put forward as a hopefully a useful checklist of the kind of issues that anyone needs to think about when they are advising a local authority about the consultation process or advising a family or commercial interest about challenging a local authority uh, consultation process. I hope this would be a useful checklist for the kind of issues that need to be considered. All of those issues are looked at in quite some detail in the Adult Social Care Law book, which also includes uh, summaries of the relevant cases. These are the grounds of consultation, you know, in, in my experience personally and through, through looking at the cases. These are the grounds of challenge that tend to succeed when challenges do succeed. So these are the issues that perhaps uh, one might want to give particular uh, consideration to. Um, sorry, just having, here we go. So, um, the public sector equality duty, um, again, this is dealt with in considerable detail in the Adult Social Care Law book, which also contains extensive citations to relevant cases. 
Um, I mean, local authorities are generally a lot better at discharging this duty these days, but one still comes across some absolute shockers, which is incredible, really, as it as it's not that difficult. And this, in, in my view, is the essence of it. The decision makers have got to have ultimately a report that makes it clear in unvarnished and robust terms what the potential risks are of whatever's proposed as well as what the benefits, justification, mitigating and monitoring measures are. And decision makers have to be advised clearly that the PSED exists, um, that it's a duty that applies to them personally and, and what that duty actually is. So um, the courts have, have made it clear that uh, they won't quash decisions based on minor breaches but there does have to be proper and conscientious focus on the substance of the PSED. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So in terms of the report to the cabinet, um, first of all, um, I'd suggest that the, in terms of uh, dealing with the, the public sector equality duty and consultation, I'd have thought that, that it would be a good idea for the body of the report to explain to decision makers what their personal duty is in relation to the results of consultation, you know, taking them conscientiously into account, and what their duty is in relation to the PSCD. Um, a uh, summary of the law is, is usually better than extensive citations from the legislation, guidance and, and case law, but obviously the summary has to be accurate. You will usually find the, 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 the full consultation materials and the full PSCD materials, which will usually be some kind of equalities impact assessment in the appendices which um, the officers are asked to, to look at. Um, So, as to um, the law, the decision makers will need to be properly informed about the legislation, the relevant statutory departmental guidance and any other policy or guidance, relevant local authority policies. Again, there just has to be a reasonable, uh, a, a, an accurate summary of what the legal parameters are. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble moving my slides about. Um, so I think. Right. Um, okay. So I think that's pretty self explanatory. Uh, obviously, you need to explain to decision makers what, what the existing policies of the local authority are. One special issue that arises in this context is whether changes and closures to service will impact on the health of vulnerable individuals, in particular where what's proposed are closures of, of, of care homes. Uh, and that's obviously something that's incredibly important. And what I've set out over the next slide it is um, a summary of the, the case law and where the courts have, have, have gone on that. Um, mediation could be used much more. It's encouraged by the courts, see the case of Cal. Obviously, it, it's, it's only going to be viable where there is time to, to engage in, in, in mediation before the service change or closure has to take place. Um, individual cases, I think I'll leave everybody to, to look at and um, finish it there in order to, 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 to finish in, in time. Um, I, again, I'm sorry that was a bit of a, a, a rush and that I had a few problems moving the, the slides about. But as I said at the beginning, it's meant to be 
a, a checklist with a few hopefully helpful pointers um, to summarise something that would usually take the best part of the day to go through. So I hope on that basis of being a sort of annotated checklist that is going to be useful for you. Um, so we're now going to move on to the education, health and care side of things. Um, and that's going to be dealt with by Fiona and, and Hafsa. So I'll just introduce them briefly, if I may. Uh, Fiona was called to the bar in 1996 and took silk just 11 years later in 2017. Uh, she works in most areas of public law, but as most of you I'm sure will know, specialises in issues that arise in relation to children and vulnerable adults. Uh, including education, health capacity, and of course, social care law, where she's in huge demand. She's one of the authors of the Law Society's Health and Social Care Handbook, uh, and a member of the Barristers Panel maintained by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, who she represented in the Supreme Court in Williams and Hackney, which I think is all about the limits of local authority powers to provide accommodation for children in need under Section 20 of the Children Act 1989. And among many other things, she's currently instructed as Senior Counsel to the Anglican and Residential Schools Investigations on behalf of the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse. Uh, Hafsa was called to the bar in 2006 and specialises in public law with a particular expertise in immigration and EU law Areas of law which now, of course, crop up all the time in social care, although they never used to. Uh, civil liberties and human rights, discrimination and commercial disputes, among other things. She's garnered a, a great reputation, has been appointed to the Attorney General's B panel of barristers already, and has appeared in lots of important cases from trafficking and the need for litigation friends for children in JR cases to challenges to large-scale workforce reductions. And she's also co-author of a very interesting practitioner's textbook called The Protections for Religious Rights, Law and Practice. So uh, now I'm going to leave you in their capable hands. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that introduction. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to speak very briefly just to introduce the topic and then we'll pass over to Hafsa who's going to deal with the process up until you get an EHC plan. And then we're going to pass over to me, who's going to talk a little bit about the contents of an EHC plan. So in a similar way to Stephen, what I would say is we're trying to achieve in 20 minutes what people write chapters of books around. So this is very much an introduction. Um, if you have any particular questions about any particular aspect, please do send us a question on chat and we will endeavour to answer it. Um, but uh, this is really an introduction to EHC plans for those who are over 18. Thank you very much. Hafsa. Um, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Fiona. Um, as um, Fiona says, I'm going to be dealing with the process up to the issue, the preparation and issue of a plan. Um, the first slide um, just sets out um, um, briefly, the uh, relevant source material, um, the relevant legislation, um, as I'm sure many of you will know, relating to EHC plans is uh, principally the Children and Families Act 2014, um, and the relevant sections are sections 36 to 51. Uh, and then you also have the Special Educational Needs and Disability Regulations 2014 which supplement the 2014 Act and, and it's part two that's the relevant part. Um, there's a Special Educational Needs and Disability Code of Practice. Um, again, as I'm sure you'll know, this provides um, statutory guidance um, on the duties, policies and procedures relating to children and young people um, with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, there is a, a detailed and helpful section on EHC assessments and plans, and that's section nine. Um, bodies, including um, local authorities, must have um, regard to the code of practice when taking decisions uh, and fulfilling their statutory duties towards um, children and young people with special educational needs. 
Um, and the first tier tribunal must also have regard to it um, when considering an appeal from a parent or a young person. So um, when would someone have an EAC plan? Um, well, a local authority um, must prepare a plan uh, for a young person where it's necessary uh, for special educational provision to be made in accordance with uh, an EHC plan. Um, there's several steps. Um, the first, there will generally be a request um, for an EHC needs assessment. Um, the local authority will then um, consider and decide whether such an assessment is necessary. Um, if the local authority decides that, that an assessment is necessary, they'll carry the assessment out. Um, then based on that assessment, um, a decision will be made by the local authority about whether or not to prepare and issue a plan. Um, and if um, the outcome of that is positive, a plan will be prepared and issued. Um, and if it's negative, there's of course a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal. Um, now, uh, section um, 36, um, subsection 2 of the 2014 Act um, says that an EHC needs assessment is an assessment of the educational health care and social care needs of a child or young person. Um, that assessment can be requested by a parent. Um, it can be requested by a young person, technically from the age of 16, although that's relatively rare. Um, and it can also be requested um, by an educational establishment. Um, and the code of practice, which I mentioned, recognises that um, others may also bring uh, a young person who has or may have special educational needs to the intention of the local authority if they think um, that a needs assessment uh, is necessary. Um, and this uh, can include uh, people like foster carers, health and social care professionals um, or other family members. Um, now, when uh, a request uh, for an assessment has been made or the local authority otherwise becomes responsible for the young person, um, the local authority must then consider and decide whether a needs assessment is necessary. Uh, and there at the top of the slide, um, you'll see um, in the first three bullet points, um, circumstances in which the local authority is or becomes responsible. Uh, and is thereby under an obligation to make a determination uh, about whether a needs assessment is, uh, is required. Um, and that you can get from section 24 of the 2014 Act, um, and, and I think is self-explanatory. Um, the decision whether or not to undertake uh, an assessment has to take place within six weeks of receiving the request. Um, that's according to Regulation 5 of the uh, SEN and Disability Regs 2014. Um, and if the local authority refuses to carry out an assessment, uh, an appeal uh, can be brought to the first tier tribunal. Now, um, what does a, a local authority um, need to um, take into account when considering whether a needs assessment is necessary or, or, and what do they need to do? Um, well, the local authority must notify the parent and young person um, and according to the code of practice, um, paragraph 9.13, um, must also notify a number of other parties um, such as the CCG, um, social care educational institution, uh, and must write to them and ask them for their views. Um, according to the same paragraph of the Code of Practice, um, the local authority will need to take into account um, a range of evidence, um, paying particular attention to, for example, evidence of um, the young person's academic attainment and rate of progress, information about the nature, extent and context um, of their special educational needs, evidence of action already being taken by the education provider to meet um, the young person's needs, um, evidence of their physical, emotional and social development and health needs. Uh, and where the young person is over 18, the local authority must also consider whether they require additional time in comparison with the majority of others of the same age who don't have special educational needs to, in order to complete um, their education or training. Um, and section 36, subsection 8 of the 2014 Act um, says that the Local, then the local authority must secure 
in other words, undertake a, a needs assessment, if having regard to those views and evidence, um, the authority is of the opinion that the young person has or may have special educational needs, uh, and it may be necessary for special educational needs provision to be made for the young person in accordance with an EHC plan. Um, the test is also set out in the Code of Practice, the statutory guidance, um, uh, and you can see that there. And, and that provides that um, um, a, uh, an assessment will be uh, necessary whether, uh, well, what has to be considered is whether, despite the relevant education provider having taken relevant and purposeful activity to identify and assess um, and meet uh, the special educational needs of the young person, the young person has uh, not made the expected progress. Um, there is a recent Court of Appeal decision called Knots and SF, uh, which is all about what necessary means in section 37.1, which um, as we'll come to see is, is the provision concerning when uh, an EHC plan needs to be prepared. Um, but it's also um, instructive, I suppose, for the purpose of um, the prior question, which we're looking at, um, in other words, whether uh, an EHC needs assessment should be un undertaken. Uh, and what the Court of Appeal um, said in that case was um, we, uh, that we agree with uh, a number of UT decisions to the effect that what is necessary um, is, uh, is an evaluative judgment based on the specific facts of a particular case uh, and it wasn't uh, a concept, concept that needed to be overdefined. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that progress is not the only factor in deciding um, if an assessment is needed, um, but um, other factors such as whether funding may be lost or whether provision um, couldn't be made without any EHC plan are also factors um, that are relevant. Um, so as to the, um, so local authorities made a decision to carry out the assessment, but well, what does the assessment uh, entail? Um, the young person uh, must be consulted. Um, the local authority also has to obtain advice from a number of organisations um, uh, about the young person's needs, the provision to meet them and outcomes. Uh, and you can see a list there on the slide. Um, if statutory bodies are asked to provide advice, um, they must respond and must do. Uh, they must respond, and they need to do so within six weeks. Uh, and that is very much long stop. Uh, the code of practice emphasises um, that the whole process uh, must be carried out in a timely manner, uh, and the time limits that are, that are set out are very much the maximum that's allowed. Um, so. Um, when, uh, so the next slide is uh, about when uh, should a plan be issued. Um, uh, so this, um, so the local authorities um, decided to carry an assessment um, and um, uh, is having to make a decision about whether or not to prepare a plan. Uh, and section 37.1 um, of the 2014 Act says, uh, in, in, uh, and this is a paraphrase, that the local authority um, must secure the preparation of an EHC plan where, in the light of the needs assessment, it's necessary for special educational provision to be made for a young person. Um, and um, there's also some um, re relevant um, material in the Code of Practice um, at paragraphs 9.53 to 9.56. Um, and I mentioned, I've mentioned already the decision um, of the Court of Appeal in Knotts. Um, uh, and there at the very bottom, um, in the uh, bottom three bullet points, um, you've got the sort, uh, broadly, um, the sort of factors which um, will need to be considered, whether the special education provision is available within the resources usually available to the institution uh, that young person attends, whether provision can be delivered um, without an EHC plan, and, and of course it's very much forward-looking uh, and not a backward-looking decision. So I'll now pass on over to um, Fiona who will deal with um, what's in a plan and um, the rest of the process. Okay. 
So you've gone through the process, which takes 20 weeks. So that's approximately five months. Um, and I don't know what's gone on um, with the slides, which seem to have disappeared. Mm. Um, I was wondering if our administrative assistant might be able to give me some assistance because my slides have just completely disappeared from my screen. Um, right. Right, they're now back. But, right, so after that little uh, technical difficulty, um, uh, by the time you get to deciding what's in a plan, you've already usually had a fight with a local authority about whether or not there should be a statutory assessment, what should be in a plan, and certainly if you're looking at um, a young person who hasn't had an EHC plan before, the first thing that most local authorities will tell you is, well, if, if you haven't had one before you're 18, I'm not really sure you should be having one after you're 18. Now that in fact is wrong, but it doesn't stop local authorities erroneously providing that information. So you've probably got a, a, a tenacious set of parents, or if you're a local authority, you will have a tenacious set of parents that you're managing. So you've gone through the statutory assessment process, you've got all the relevant material, there is then a set of quite strict, um, well, strict in comparison to social care and healthcare needs where there's a lot more freedom, a set of strict requirements as to what should be provided by whom and when. So although the plan can look um, any way that the local authority wants to, and so we have 152 different local authorities, and so we have 152 different ways that plans are drafted, they used to have to be um, consistent, now they can be anyway, but they all have to include these um, matters. And what I'm going to do is just go through what should be in an EHC plan. So this applies not just if you're looking at providing educational advice, but for any of you who do work in the court of protection, if you're looking at social care for um, young adults who've got significant disabilities, they will nearly always have an EHC plan. So it's worthwhile looking at that when you're providing them with any advice or certainly asking to see a copy of it and the appendices as it usually provides some very useful information no matter what the nature of the litigation that you're trying to be engaged with. So um, section A is views, interests and aspirations. Now that tends largely to be written by parents or the young person so can vary from two sentences through to really a mini memoir. Um, there's then section B, which is special educational needs, then C, healthcare needs related to SEN, but not, but not special educational needs. Now I'll come on to what that distinction is, is in a moment. Then social care needs relating to disability. So that would be any needs for a young person under the CARE Act or any transitional provision they're being provided with uh, under the Children Act 1989, pending the outcome of the CARE Act assessments and the provision of um, services under the CARE Act. E is the outcomes, so that's where you would like the young person to get to by the age of 21, by the age of 25, um, 25 being the oldest age, the end of the academic year when someone is 25 being the oldest point in time in which an EHC plan can be provided. F is special educational provision. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And then G is healthcare provision and social care provision. So the idea behind it is you can have one document which sets out everything that a young person might need all in one place. Handy, one would think. Now that tends to work out more to, more to be the exception rather than the rule. Last but by no means least, I is the name of institution or the type of education that someone is going to be provided with. And certainly for those over the age of 18, there are a range of provisions which could be set out in there. And J deals with the direct educational payments which will be provided and any direct payments made under health and social care. 
there being a right to direct payments in education, although again, the right to direct payments is much more limited in the context of education in practice than it is in either health or social care settings. So what are special educational needs? So what should go in part B? Um, special educational needs are those needs um, in, where somebody has a significantly greater difficulty learning than the majority of others of the same age. So it only applies if you have difficulties, not if you are exceptional. And there was a series of case law about people who are incredibly clever uh, and very gifted. And it's been found roundly that that is not a special educational need. And so not only do you have to have that learning difficulty, but it has to prevent or hinder you using facilities of the same age in a mainstream post-16 setting. So for the vast majority of those with some mild learning disabilities, they may well be able to cope in the local FE college or in um, working in an apprenticeship, for example. Um, so we're really talking about those young people who need some form of specialist training and oversight post 16 and particularly post 18. Unfortunately, the, um, the system under the SEN code of practice still seems to assume um, that young people will leave a school setting at 16, whereas as we know, everybody has to receive some form of education and training until they're at 18 now. Um, so a learning difficulty really is anything which is inherent within the child, which makes learning significantly harder from him than most others. And that's what Lord um, Justice Sedley confirmed that in the case of Bromley, uh, um, of the SENT versus Bromley back in 1999. So what should be in part B is a specification of all the special educational needs, which includes, and this is where there are often lots of disputes between different parts, different public bodies, which includes any social or healthcare provision which educates or trains, as set out by section 21.5 of the Children and Families Act 2014. So what you often find is you've got a young person, for example, with Down syndrome, age 19 or 20, they're at the local FE college, but they still need some form of occupational therapy and some form of speech and language therapy to help them articulate more clearly, as often um, children with Down syndrome have quite low tone, can find it quite difficult to articulate, um, and need some help with that. And then there, therefore, there will then be a dispute between the education authority and the healthcare authority about whether those needs are or aren't special educational needs for that purpose. And I'll come on to tell you why they nearly always should be special educational needs in as a moment. So what you should be doing if you're advising parents or if you're advising a local authority is looking at part B and working out, does it identify clearly all the things which this person, young person, finds it difficult to achieve and do in the context of an educational setting? And needs can cut across different areas. You don't need a particular diagnosis. You don't need a particular, you don't need to tick any particular boxes in order to have special educational needs. It's not based, um, it's a sort of social model of disability rather than a clinical model of disability, if you were to think about it in that way. So um, the second important uh, concept for you to understand is what special educational provision is. And again, it's incredibly broad. It is anything additional to or different from the education or training that anybody else gets at the same age in mainstream facilities. So if you have someone who requires um, a helper, some form of therapy, some form of additional support, some kind of um, additional equipment or facilities, they are all special educational provision. And again, as I've already explained, that includes health and social care provision which educates or trains and which tends to be the subject of dispute between bodies as everybody plays past the ball as to who is responsible for what. Now the reason that this is important as to which section things go in in a plan is because if something is classed as special educational provision, then the local authority is under a mandatory and non-delegable duty to provide it, which can be enforced by way of judicial review. 
as you know, if you've come to some of our other seminars or if you work in this area, those duties are significantly tighter, shall we say, and significantly easier to enforce than the duties as set out under the CARE Act, because most care plans are often written in a less than specified way, despite the fact they should be, and also in respect of healthcare, um, duties under the Health Act 2006 don't have to be specified in any particular way or manner. So there is a um, there is an incentive, shall we say, for those individuals who represent parents or young people to try and make sure that as much of the provision as possible is set out in section F and therefore is special educational provision. Now, if you are not happy with um, the way that um, a plan has been um, issued um, or the contents of the plan, then you can appeal against that to the first tier tribunal under section 51 of the Children and Family Act 2014. And you can appeal against the contents of parts B, F and I, but not the rest of it. But I'll come on to talk about that in a moment. So turning to what special education provision is, education is deemed to be instruction for life. So anything which is directly related to a pupil's learning difficulty and related to a specific educational outcome um, should be considered to be educational. So just to give you some ideas of where the courts have found that provision is special educational provision, despite the fact that it might not be being provided by an education authority. Speech and language therapy is um, in 99.9% .9 of cases educational. Uh, largely occupational therapy is, largely physiotherapy is within the context of a, an educational setting, largely um, behavioural management, so clinical psychological in input, input by behaviour analysts for those young people with autism, psychiatric intervention, counselling, can be held to be special educational provision and uh, things such as a low arousal or low distraction environment could be held to be special educational provision. Um, and as the upper tribunal said in DC and Hertfordshire, education is not just about the acquisition of verbs. So when you're trying to identify what may or may not be special educational provision, I always, um, and the DC case reaffirms this, tries to look at, is it something to do with the curriculum? Then it's likely to be educational. Is it to do with instruction, schooling or training and differences in facilities, curriculum or staffing arrangements which need to be made? Then it is likely to be special, um, then it is likely to be educational provision. Um, furthermore, within section F, you have to set out what is going to be provided. So for example, how much one-to-one -one support somebody needs, by whom and for how many hours, any specialist teaching, the qualifications and experience of any specialist teacher, class size, etc, etc. So it can be quite a prescriptive document. Um, and I've identified there, the law has since 1998, a decision of the late lamented Mr Justice Laws, um, has identified that section F should be so specific and clear so as to leave no room for doubt as to what has been decided. So when you're looking at an EHC plan, and you're looking at section F, you want to be seeing something which makes it clear who's going to be doing this, when are they going to be doing it, why, uh, how often are they going to be doing it, and when is it going to be reviewed. And if you don't see that, then arguably there may well be a right of appeal. Right, um, I can't seem to move that. Sorry. Anna, would you mind moving me to the next slide, please? Um, the other matter that can be set out in um, residential provision is um, in part F is whether or not somebody requires residential provision, which is education beyond the school day. Um, that is only required and to be set out educationally if somebody needs to generalise skills from the classroom into other settings. And that can only be done in the context of accommodation. Um, and there are I've set out two cases there which um, 
set out the test which the first tier tribunal applies. Anna, would you mind moving me to the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, I then turn to section I, which is the institution. Um, now, a, a young person has a qualified right to name certain sorts of institutions and a local authority only has limited ways in which it can say no. So again, if you want a particular form of provision, um, an EHC plan for young people with significant disabilities, whether they're learning disabilities or physical disabilities, or people with mental health problems, um, all of these things may become relevant. Um, so if the young person wants to go to a maintained school, unlikely for those over the age of 18, for those between 16 and 18, that's a distinct possibility. An academy, um, again, academies usually cater for those up to the age of 18, although a number of special schools are now opening 19 to 25 um, specific provision in order to be able to keep their young people and not lose them at the age of 18. Any institution within the further education sector, a special post-16 um, institution which is on a list approved by the Secretary of State. If you Google Section 41 list it will give you a list of mainly charitably run or independent um, post-16 often residential, not always residential facilities, which the Secretary of State has approved of and therefore um, which um, and get a specific form of funding from the Secretary of State um, as a result. Um, but the quid pro quo on that is that they have to be named. So if any of those institutions, if your clients want any of those institutions or if the local authority wants um, the young person to attend any of those institutions, then those institutions um, can be named and must be named, in fact, under the legislation, unless they are either unsuitable, incompatible with the education of others. That doesn't mean generally others, that basically means other people in the class or other people in the year group, or it would be incompatible with the efficient use of resources. Simply put, it costs too much money. And next slide, please, Anna. Um, if the institution falls outside those particular, um, th those, it doesn't fall within, shall we say, those particular criteria, then a local authority still has power to name it, but doesn't have to do so. But in all circumstances, no matter what is named, um, Section 9 of the Education Act 1996 applies, um, sort of in a somewhat qualified way to those over the age of 18, which again, in effect, says um, anyone who's making any decisions about where someone should go should have regard to the wishes of the person concerned, as long as it isn't going to impact on the education of others or isn't going to be too expensive. And as I've already said, there is a right of appeal against B, F and I to the first tier tribunal. Um, Anna, would next slide, please. Sorry. Um, the next thing I should say is there's a right of review every year. It's called an annual review. There are quite a number of procedural um, matters which have to be sorted out. People have to write reports. There has to be a meeting. That meeting has to be attended by, cat, by the young person and by their parents and by various other professionals at which there is a discussion about whether the provision should alter or remain the same. Um, and there is a right of appeal if um, the EHC plan isn't amended after that. So there's basically can be an annual right of appeal for if some <laughs> 25 years, possibly. Um, the local authority has the power to amend at any time an EHC plan, but largely it tends to do so after any annual review. And there is also a right for a parent to ask for reassessment. So to say, in fact, things have changed so much that I think all the professionals who originally saw the young person should have to come in again and have another look at them. Um, the other power that the local authority has under the Children and Families Act is to cease to maintain an EHC plan, but it can only cease to maintain that if it is no longer necessary for the plan to be maintained and for somebody over 18, if the education or training outcomes specified in the plan have been achieved. Now, practically, 
the reality is that for the group of young people who continue to have EHC plans over the age of 18, the likelihood of their education and training outcomes being met between the ages of 18 and 25 is likely to be limited. So for those group of individuals, it is likely that their educational training outcomes are fairly broad and are to do with the acquisition of basic employment or basic lifelong learning skills or basic independence and choice making skills. And the next slide, please. Um, so I've set out the criteria for ceasing to maintain on this slide. Uh, and most importantly, um, even if somebody stops going to an educational institution, you can't stop the EHC plan unless there has been an annual review and the young person has said, I don't wish to return or a return would not be appropriate. So, for example, if the young person has said, look, I'm, look I've got a full time job in Sainsbury's, I really don't want to carry on going to the local college two days a week. Um, qualifications are not essential for education for this group of individuals. And the Upper Tribunal has on a number of occasions said that um, education for this group of young people is really about developing basic life skills. And that is as valuable and as important as a certificate or a piece of paper. Um, next slide, please, Anna. Um, now I pass over to Ben and apologies for my inability to work the screen sharing this afternoon. Thank you. I'll just introduce Ben. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona and Hatsa. That was that was brilliant. Um, yeah, I was speaking about three weeks ago to a solicitor who'd in, in a local authority who'd instructed me in a judicial review case, and she just slipped into the conversation at a certain point that everybody in this quite well-known local authority was getting very excited because it was the first time that they'd been judicially reviewed. <laughs> I nearly fell off my my chair. Um, um, so whether you are um, experienced at being judicially reviewed or, or not, or experienced at judicially reviewing or not, it's always good to have a look back at the relevant practice and procedure uh, from time to time. And, and that's exactly what Ben Ben's going to do next. He was called for bar in 2016. And in the relatively short space of time since then, he's made a uh, pretty big name for himself in public law cases, from planning to immigration to uh, SEN social entitlement tribunal hearings, where he regularly appears for both appellants, families and, and, and local authorities. He's been heavily involved in cases that range from the law relating to the protection of badgers to uh, very recently exclusion orders around abortion clinics, which I believe is currently pending in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, he, like Hafsa, he's been a regular in the immigration tribunals, has appeared into the, in the inquiry into child sexual abuse led by, led by Fiona, I believe, and has co-written a chapter on GP law in the NHS law and practice book, which, to which a, a number of people in Landmark have contributed under the umbrella of, of David Locke, QC and Hannah Gibbs. And now he's going to talk about judicial review practice and procedure. Thanks very much Stephen, uh, thanks for that introduction. I'm um, hoping the PowerPoint's going to work for me. Well, there we go, that's great. Um, as Stephen said, I'm going to give you, a, hopefully, it's a quick overview really of judicial review practice and procedure. It's quite um, uh, generic, uh, obviously judicial review arises in a number of contexts if you're working particularly for local authority, um, but also in the care context as well. But there are general rules of procedure that apply across the board. Um, I thought as I was listening it might be worth just saying quickly what the judicial review actually is and um, what, what I've come up with is it's really it's a it's a legal challenge against the public authority um, where that public authority has make it, made a decision uh, about you uh, or which is relevant to you uh, and you want to do something about that decision so rather than just wanting damages you actually want to change the decision have it quashed or, 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 or made again that basically what a judicial review is and when you're in that situation, then you are really bound by part 54 of the civil procedure rules, which explain exactly how you go about bringing a judicial review um, in the administrative court. And that's where presentation starts um, with a couple of key places to go for information, probably much more reliable than me, um, but uh, a little bit more weighty. 
Um, uh, so that's part 54 of CPR and the white book. Um, I'd show you a copy of it, but my laptop's actually sitting on it at the moment. Um, and the relevant practice direction. And then the admin court judicial review guide online is actually a really, really helpful uh, source of information, particularly if you're litigant in person as well. It's actually more accessible than the white book. Um, and so I'd, I'd recommend going there if in doubt. Uh, right, so what I've done is divided judicial review into a few different components that kind of commonly crop up. I'm talking to you briefly about those. The first, and, and probably one of the more defining features of judicial review is the time limit. Um, where, whereas in a normal civil uh, claim, you'd have about six years to bring your claim for damages, you must bring a judicial review very, very quickly indeed. So the rule is that you have to bring your claim promptly and in any event, not later than three months. And um, first of all, the courts have tried to define what promptly means um, by saying it uh, imparts an obligation to act with all reasonable celerity. Uh, but, um, but even more important than that um, is not to be fooled by the uh, not later than three months part in uh, 54.5 there because there are a number of occasions where uh, claimants have waited three months to bring their claim and been told no you're out of time um, even though you're in three months you didn't bring it promptly enough so if you're a claimant um, what you really want to be doing is working to bring the claim as soon as you're aware of it and I think if you can show that you have been taking regular and reasonable steps to bring your claim throughout and there are no sort of unexplained or unexplainable delays then you're probably okay but but be aware that when you're in a situation where you're thinking of bringing judicial review time really is uh, of the essence you can't ex you can't extend the deadline by agreement with the parties so if you do overrun um, all you can do is uh, seek permission from the courts uh, which I've gone to in a second, but another important point is obviously the time doesn't necessarily run from the date of the decision, although that should always be your starting point. Um, it may be though that a decision has been made about you that you weren't aware of, um, or you weren't aware of sufficient information about the decision in order to uh, bring your claim. Um, in that case, time will be deemed to have started to run when you had adequate information to bring the claim. But I would say that in the vast majority of cases, you will know when the decision has been made and that should be treated as um, the start of the time limit. Now, as to the discretion to extend time, there are no fixed hard and fast rules about when the court will extend time for you, except to say that it is, it is quite reluctant to do so. Um, the belief being that public authorities should be able to make decisions um, and move on and, 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 and they need to be able to govern effectively and not be constantly sort of having to um, uh, be challenged. In, uh, relevant examples um, in the list there, I mean, obviously if you didn't know about the decision then uh, that is a good uh, a reason to extend time, there's authority on that. Sometimes where a claim uh, raises a, uh, an issue of general public importance or perhaps even just an issue that the individual judge is interested in, um, it can be as simple as that, um, you might get an extension of time and often I think it's sometimes linked with the merit of the claim as well, a, a, a judge looking at a claim that I think has quite a lot of merit may be more inclined to extend time. Um, it was historically the case that um, delays in obtaining legal aid were a, a good excuse for extending time, That that's probably not the case now, um, the court uh, of appeal having found in a slightly different context in Kigan that that wasn't uh, a good reason to extend time. Um, so one needs to be quite careful with that and you know, if in doubt you just tr need to try and get at least a claim issued as soon as possible just to be within the time limit and maybe subsequently amend it uh, if you can, if you can get funding. Um, in terms of uh, applying to extend time, that must be included in your claim uh, form itself. You apply for an order to extend time and that question is dealt with at uh, what is called the permission stage in a judicial review, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So it's, it's dealt with up front uh, before you have any hearing usually. Um, and once it's been determined, uh, it can't be reopened. So once you've been, uh, once a court said, yes, you're in time, the defendant can't come back at a later stage and reopen that point. Oh, yeah. Okay bit of a lag. Um, there we go. Uh, just a tiny bit about pre-action protocol. Um, 
it applies in the judicial review context as it does in most other civil uh, procedural contexts. Uh, it should be followed and if it's not then uh, you may suffer the consequences in terms of costs at the conclusion of proceedings. Um, there is a specific pre-action protocol for judicial review claims. Um, really, if you're a claimant, you have to send a letter which sets out the kind of bare bones of your claim and you know what action you want the defendant to take. Um, and if if, if appropriate, you know there might be documents which are relevant to the decision which you need to see um, if you're going to bring your claim, and you can ask for those documents. Um, it is quite rare, but not unheard of, that you know if you have a good pre-action letter and a good case. The public authority will write back and say yes we, we, we accept that you're right and we'll try and settle it um, but but more often than not they, they, they don't agree with that um, and, and you move on um, but one important fact to note again is although you should always try to comply with the pre-action process you cannot let that get in the way of actually issuing a claim in time the courts have found that's not a good enough excuse to extend time so you know if your your three months is about to run out don't you know um, the main thing is get the claim in and deal with the problem with pre-action, um, uh, uh, not having complied with the pre-action uh, stage at a later date, so, so do be aware of that. Um, so issuing a judicial review, um, quite a long kind of boring list, I won't go through all of these points, um, but the claim form is form N641 and there's a picture of the first page of it. Um, worth remembering if you're bringing a claim to include details of any interested parties, um, who might have an interest in defending the claim or uh, being um, uh, so for example it might be a private care, a private residential care home that might be involved in the decision they might well be an interested party uh, in the claim so put details of, of, the, of those in so that they could uh, defend the claim if they, if they so wished. Um, usually when you submit the claim form there is a box put in your grounds and a box put in the facts it's, it's probably not big enough it's never big enough for me <laughs> as I like to say uh, quite a lot and usually what, what happens is you would attach a separate we generally call a statement of facts and grounds to the to the claim form where you set out your case in much more detail and courts probably find that easier uh, to read. Um, uh, the main a couple of main main things you know, the bits I've underlined it, unlike in a normal civil claim with the judicial review you do need to include with your claim form all of the documents that you uh, rely on for the whole claim so it's all up front so there's a lot of a burden placed on a claimant in the judicial review claim because not only do you have to bring it very quickly you have to amass all of your evidence you know at the same time um, uh, and so you, you, know, you do if the documents and if necessary witness statement done and you're happy with them um, before you issue the claim uh, and the way in which you do that is you you are told by the court that the practice direction requires you to file with your claim your claim in a paginated and indexed bundle of course we're living in slightly strange times now and actually uh, everything is being done electronically and i've included a link there to the there's specific sort of covid guidance on e-funding it's they're very very specific instructions about what sorts of pdf you have to put your file in to and how you should hyperlink everything together and i won't go through all of that but be sure to read that guidance before issuing a claim um, at the moment because things are a bit different then once you've issued it uh, it's fairly obvious you need to serve it but again unlike normal civil claims you would generally be required to serve it yourself um, and uh, you must do that within seven days of the date of issue. So again, do quite quickly. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. And where it used to be that you'd put in a load of folders in the post, uh, it typically would be done electronically now as well. Um, I thought I'd talk uh, a bit about urgent applications because they do arise quite a lot, and particularly in this context, um, and uh, the procedure for them can be a little bit complicated. Um, but before doing that, I've got a bit of a health warning because there, there was a time um, and the courts have been concerned about uh, legal representatives abusing the urgent applications procedure. I, th I think effectively to put judges under pressure, of, you know, it, and it was often used in the immigration context with removals and deportations, last minute pressure to, to, to make a decision. So deliberately waiting till the last minute to bring your claim. Uh, this got to the position this got so bad really that the court issued quite firm guidance that said you know if if you do not follow if you abuse this process or you don't follow it properly and we will haul the uh, relevant solicitor 
and solicitors firm up in front of us and we will ask them to explain exactly what's going on here. Um, so the courts are very alive to misuse of this process and so it does need to be used wisely uh, and sensibly. And also if you're an advocate, you need to remember that where you're dealing with something on an urgent basis, there's a much higher duty on you um, to make clear both the strengths and weaknesses of your case um, so that the judge is, is fully aware. And if, if you're an advocate and you don't do that, um, you can again be, be in a bit of trouble uh, with the courts. But as to how you go about doing it, in a sort of typical urgent um, claim, which is not an out of hours claim, and I'll go on to those, you need to fill in the form N463 as well as your claim form. And, and what that form asks you to put in basically is an explanation of why your claim is so urgent and how and when you want to expect the court to deal with it. Um, but as I said, you do need to put in the rest of your claim as well. So you need to work very quickly uh, to put that in. And there, are, there is a judge basically is listed to look at all those applications that come in as they come in and will then give pretty quick directions about how the case, claim is going to be dealt with. Um, so that's that's very simple. Just put in put in the form, obviously, um, and other papers. And again, there's there is as you can see that bottom bullet point. There's guidance as to how that's all done. And in COVID, there's a special email address that you email. It's all electronic. Um, if you need to make your application outside of sitting hours, uh, put those in there. Then you need to use the out of hours process, which is that the um, representative so you can only use this if you're represented you can't use it in this way if you're a litigant in person but see the admin court guidance for more on that um you need to phone that number although it, i'm afraid it doesn't look quite right to me that number but you can find the number on the admin court guide if that's wrong um you speak to the queen's bench division out of hours duty clerk and you say i need to bring an out of hours um judicial review claim you know don't you say much more than that they they will then send you a form to fill in which is which is quite short it explains very brief details about about um about the claim why you need to speak you know, what you need the court to do uh and um you send that and then documents that you have in the claim to the uh, out of house clerk they then liaise with the out of hours on call judge and the judge will make a decision. They will often make a decision on the papers, but but sometimes they'll decide they need to speak to um, the relevant representatives and they'll give you a call. You know, it's a bit strange to get a call from, from a high court judge in the evening, say, and you really need to be careful that you, you, you stress the strengths and weaknesses of your case because you are the only, typically that the respondent won't be available, won't necessarily know enough about the case to comment on it. So the duty on, of candor on you is extremely high um, and, and, and courts expect you to, to assist them with that. Uh, so how do you respond to a claim? Um, if you've been served with a claim form and you want to actively defend the judicial review you need to file an acknowledgement of service um, and that acknowledgement of service must include as you said a, a summary of your grounds for, for responding and it's typically referred to as a summary of grounds of resistance um, which is a, a you know you, you sort of yeah it's, it's like a defense but um to, to the claim really but, it's, but in summary form you, you don't need to go into all of the detail you're just really your aim is to try and convince the court that the claim isn't even arguable and should be um, should be uh, should not be allowed to proceed. You will, if the, if the claim is allowed to proceed, get a second chance. Really, at putting more detail in your defence at a later stage. Um, you may attach evidence to your summary grounds, but you don't have to. So that's that's documents. So unlike the claimant, you don't have to put in your documents at this stage. Um, it is often done where there's a particularly relevant document that you would like to rely on. And sometimes. Uh, public authorities even put in witness statements, short witness statements at that stage, but I think you don't really want to overload the court with detailed evidence if you can avoid it because your aim is to make the claim look very simple and um, unfounded really if you're defending a claim, so you don't want to <laughs> add complexity to it if you can avoid it. Um, but there is a duty of candor on defence in judicial review claims, um, but that doesn't usually require them to disclose documents at this stage, they just need to make sure that everything they say uh, can be backed up and is true. Um, and then you have, you have 21 days from the date of service, the claim form to put in your acknowledgement of service. 
Uh, what happens then is um, the court will make a decision about whether it's going to grant permission. So judicial review is a two-stage process. To go to a full, full claim, you need permission, um, and the court needs to decide that the claim is arguable. Uh, and uh, that's first of all decided on the papers, so the court will look at your claim, the acknowledgement service. Um, the test for arguability is technically uh, a low one, so your case isn't hopeless, frivolous or vexatious, but in reality the courts tend to apply a bit of a higher standard um, than that. Um, and I think they need to sort of have a feel that this looks like it's a case that could win um, if there was more detail provided. Uh, so if permission is refused, you have an automatic right generally to request an oral renewal hearing. So if you get a paper decision saying you don't, you don't have permission, you can immediately request an oral renewal hearing within seven days, or seven days to do that, put in some reasons and you will get your hearing. Um, they're happening, I think, quite quickly at the moment. Uh, and that will usually be about half an hour where you can you know, restate your case orally in front of a judge. And quite a few cases are granted permission at that later stage because you get a chance to refine and improve your arguments. Um, costs at the permission stage are usually limited to the cost of acknowledging service. So if you don't get permission, um, you will have to pay your the defendant's uh, reasonable and proportionate cost of acknowledging service. If you go to a permission hearing, typically, unless there are exceptional circumstances, you won't have to pay your opponent's costs of attending that hearing. Um, just, there we go. Um, post permission. If you get permission, then, as I said, the defendant and interested party uh, have the opportunity to file more detailed grounds of defence and have to do that 35 days after the order granting permission. Um, sorry, that I might have missed. Yeah. If you do get permission refused at the hearing, then you, you, you can appeal that to the Court of Appeal and be aware that you only have seven days to put in your appeal, appellant's notice. So that's a very quick turnaround um, there. Yeah, but if you do get permission, as I said, 35 days of detailed grounds um you, you you put those in that's when you, that's when if you're a defendant you put in all of your written evidence as well and then once you've done that the court will contact the parties to arrange a listing for the hearing and um, parties have to provide time estimates and things like that then you will um then you will follow whatever directions you've been given for the hearing slightly interesting point arises here because almost always now and i think as a matter of routine when you get your order granting permission the court will set out directions for the hearing. Um, if you don't, then there are standard directions in practice, direction 54A, but there's a bit of an odd and most certainly must be incorrect note there that says with skills and arguments, courts calculate um, it should really be three weeks. So, so when the court issues directions, they clearly corrected this and they say 21 days, but if they don't, you just need to be aware of that um, little quirk. Then you have your, so you, so you need to put in a skeleton argument, a bundle, and defendant puts in a skeleton argument. Then you have your substantive hearing before a judge, and then um, judgment is usually reserved and costs, consequential matters dealt with uh, on the papers after judgment is handed down uh, by the court. Okay, just a few very brief, quick points, I think. Now, on evidence, as I said, you, you know, if you're going to, you can't put in any evidence unless you put it in in accordance with the, the relevant rule of practice direction, so at, at the relevant time. If you're a claimant you want to put in, for example, new evidence, or the same for a defendant, you need the permission of the court. You need to, you need to put in a formal application along with that evidence. Usually those applications are dealt with at the substantive hearing. So you might deal with this at the beginning and say, I'd like to also rely on this additional evidence, here's my application, and this is why, you know, and the court will deal with it all in the round. Cross-examination is very rare in judicial reviews because facts aren't meant to be, or aren't typically in dispute. And tip, you often, the, the question of expert evidence, I think is a bit, no, I mean, there's a bit of inconsistent practice, but technically I think you require the court's permission to rely on expert evidence, but very commonly it's not sought and no one raises any issues about it. If you want to amend your claim, um, uh, after you've been granted permission, then you need the court's permission, you need to make an application. Um, and again, typically those are dealt with at the substantive hearing. So you put in an application with your amended grounds and um, at the hearing, probably at the beginning or at the relevant time, you'll say, this is my new ground and this is why I want to amend my ground to, to, to rely on it. Um, I, I think the courts are quite permissive, but obviously, uh, you know, it's very important the defendant has an adequate opportunity to, to respond to any changes. 
and it should keep you to a minimum. Um, but new decisions, it's not uncommon in judicial review claims for a defendant to defend its claim by making a new decision, which I think is a better decision than the one you're challenging. Uh, in those circumstances, you, you may decide you want to challenge that decision as well. Um, the courts are quite keen to avoid a, a rolling judicial review where you just you 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 basically change your, your judicial review to, to to the new decision then there's another decision and it just goes on and on forever so i think the preferred practice is that once a defendant makes a new decision it withdraws its original decision you withdraw your claim you bring a new claim against the new decision but the courts tend to deal with it pragmatically and you can often work these things out between the parties um, so sometimes they'll say, well, the better that you just amend your existing claim. Um, there is a lot of flexibility and, and uh, that's set out in the uh, case I've cited there, the last bullet. Costs, general rules on cost supply in judicial review claims is important to remember, especially if you're dealing with a lot of tribunal claims where everything is different. If you lose, you will be expected to pay your opponent's costs. Um, uh, the... Uh, M and Croydon case sets out a few principles. It sort of identifies three types of cases really. One where you bring your claim and you go to substantive hearing and you win on all grounds, all the, your opponent settles and gives you everything you want. You should generally expect to re recover all of your costs if that happens. Uh, the other is if you go to um, uh, court and you win on um, a part of some of the issues that you, you've raised, um but not all of them then usually the court's in a position to make an assessment about who should pay whose costs and it will depend on how reasonable it was to bring the bits of the claim you didn't win on what your conduct has been like um how significant those bits were and the court will usually be able to work out what it does but sometimes where it's a bit unclear it will say that there should be no order uh, for costs and then the third type of case is where claims settle but on a basis which the certificate go before a court but on a basis which isn't exactly what the defendant the claimant had asked for at all and in those circumstances it'd be really difficult for courts usually to work out who should get whose costs so often there will be uh, no orders to costs in those uh, cases but generally and it's important because there are a lot of cases that settle where defendants do just withdraw their decisions if that's what you've asked for in your judicial review and that's what the defendant does you should be deemed to be successfully entitled to your costs and there's a case called Tesla which is very very helpful for claimants in that regard. Costs are usually summar summarily assessed so do remember if you're going for a substantive hearing to put in your statement of costs. And I think that's it so sorry I, I think we've overrun there slightly but um, and there's now Q&A time. Brilliant thanks very much Ben. Um, in terms of the Q&A, the plan was for me to sort of read out from a list of questions and work out who, who might be best placed to answer them. But on, on my chat function, I can't see any questions at all, which um, in my experience would be quite unusual. <laughs> um, but it could be possibly that um, um, looking at how it works, that some questions might have been sent to direct to individual speakers. No? Not me, Stephen, sorry. Well, well this is definitely a, a turn up. It, it may reflect the fact that it's nearly <laughs> six o'clock. <laughs> I don't know, but I've, I don't know that it's a webinar. <clears throat> I've never done a seminar before without me any questions at all. Um, but, you know. I think we've blinded them by our brilliant... <laughs> by science, <laughs> the yeah, total yeah. silence and submission. To be fair, it's not as much fun, you know, typing a question no. in and, and, and then getting an answer on a, a webinar. But we did, we did have a lot, actually, with our, on, our, on, our, on our last one. So, if, you know, um, if anyone has got any questions at all, we'll be really, really pleased but to answer them or to have a go at answering them. But it's not, um, you know, um, doesn't actually have to be done right now because, you know, questions can be pinged direct to us through the website um, afterwards. Because now it might actually be quite embarrassing to be the one person who asks a question, but it shouldn't be. Uh, well, um, 
Uh, I mean, hypothetically, something may have gone wrong with the with the um, with the chat function as well, because there was lots of there was an awful lot of chat last time we did it, including you know even people who didn't want to ask a question just sort of just saying something. Um, okay, well the chat's working. <laughs> I guess <laughs> there's just <laughs> nice comments being made, which is which is. Brilliant. Well, uh, I'm just going to say, unless a, a question actually like pops up, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Ben and, and Hafsa and, and Fiona for, uh, I was going to say three, but actually two, well, it's probably three really interesting talks. I certainly learned a lot about education, health and social care plans, and it was good to have a, a really thorough resume on judicial review practice and procedure. Um, so I think what I will do is, because um, I don't know actually how to do this, is just ask Anna to well, say thank you to all of you on behalf of all of us and ask Anna to, well, oh, sorry. No, there is a, <laughs> there is a question. Right, I think this is oh. one for Hafsa and I. It is. is. If social care or health care is defined in the EHCP but not delivered by either, either health or social care, how can it be enforced? Right, well, um, for health care, there is a, um, any health care set out in the EHC plan has to, under section 42, be delivered. So there is a mandatory obligation upon the health services to do so. So my view is, is you could judicially review the health service for their failure to deliver the provision as set out in the EHC plan and as far as social care is concerned again the Care Act 2014 should um, mean that you have a specified care plan of some description and therefore again the Care Act 2014 for adults sets out a mandatory duty which can be enforced by way of judicial review so basically it can be enforced by way of judicial review just under slightly different um, parts of the statutory in the terms of healthcare under section 42 um, of the EHCP of the Children and Families Act 2014 under the Care Act under I think it's section 21 of the Care Act 2014 I'm not entirely clear I'm not entirely sure but it's the provision which says you must meet eligible needs and you can do so so the answer to that is you can uh, judicially review them or bring a claim to the local government ombudsman uh, there's a question which has come straight through to me, which I don't think you've seen, but it might be that Fiona and Hafsa are, well, it definitely will be that Fiona and Hafsa are a better place for me to answer it. Although I can give an answer to it. But the question is, uh, do you know any way that you can persuade the FTT to order a local authority to conduct a social care assessment where they haven't complied with their statutory duty? And while Fiona, Bob, perhaps we don't need a, a millisecond to think about that. The, the one obvious way of dealing with that from a, 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 you know, an adult social care perspective is to write them a letter saying, if you don't carry out a social care assessment of my client, I'm going to judicially review you and I'm giving you 14 days. And if they don't do it, to judicially review them. And that usually works. And it's one of the easiest adult social care judicial reviews that anyone can bring. <laughs> but that doesn't quite answer the question of no. how you persuade an FTT. No, the answer to that question is, is no, there is no power. The powers of the FTT are quite limited and at right. the moment only extend to educational provision. There are a new set of, there is a national trial going on whereby social care and health care provision can be appealed against and recommendations can be made about amending the provision. Um, and I suppose that, so the FTT could recommend that there needs to be an up-to-date social care assessment. Um, the local authority then has to then say within six weeks whether or not they're agreeing with that recommendation or not. You can then potentially judicially review <laughs> um, the decision of the local authority not to follow the recommendation of the social care provider, which is a slightly clumsy way of going about it. The national trial, i.e. the ability to complain both about education, health and social care is going on for another year because of COVID. 
So you can, you are going to be able to bring those claims at the end of which it is very much hoped that we will basically create certainly for young adults up to the age of 25, a kind of one-stop shop appeal system so that they can appeal against all aspects of their EHC plan. Um, and in those circumstances, it may well be that in the future, there will be a right to do that, but not at the moment. And so I agree with Stephen, you just have to write them a letter and JR them at the moment. It seems crazy. It seems like the, the FTT system almost makes it more difficult to get to, to, get to grips with that, with that yeah. issue. I mean, I mean um, yeah. It creates a layer of complexity at the moment because of the recommendations, but it's being done for the right reasons. So we have to kind yes, of cross our teeth. Long term. <laughs> so we have to, because it's the closest. I mean, I've been in practice as not as long as you, Stephen, but nearly. So both of us are quite long in the tooth. And for as long as I have been in practice, there has been a desire to have a kind of one stop shop for children with disabilities, mm. to stop there being a patchwork system of provision and enforcement and this is the sort of closest we've come so we just have to try and hold on to that yeah but it is well, very annoying <laughs> well, I know when you say that and it's absolutely true but I mean one of the bizarre things is is you you had all the um, criticisms of adult social care legislation it yeah. was piecemeal it was chaotic it was so on and so so forth and the law commission worked on it and you know we get the adults uh, you know we get the care act 2014 yeah where which puts pretty much everything in one place and in wales i can't yeah, remember, got their health and well-being they've, they've, they've got their health and uh, whatever it's called where they yeah. do children adult social care yeah i mean how we've got like a dozen well it's still primary legislation relating to children about 500 statutory instruments and five million pieces of guidance i mean it's it's crazy isn't it, it is. but, but but there's a bit of unity being sought it, well, they were due to the DfE just before COVID did announce that it was carrying out a wild scale review of the effectiveness of the Children Act 89. And one of the reasons for that was about maybe looking at harmonising and bringing various things together. But that, I think, has been in reality completely put on the back burner mm -hmm. um, by everything that's now going on. So I wouldn't anticipate there being any parliamentary time for any kind of consolidation, because I agree with you, Steve, certainly not in the next two years, I wouldn't imagine. No, but it just seems bizarre that the, 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 the law related to children is so, so fractured. Well, and when, I can say this, when the Children and Family Act was coming in, I lobbied, along with lots of other people, on behalf of various parental advocacy groups and various charities, to try and in effect have the Children and Families Act as the one-stop shop yeah, at the same time as the great. Care Act. But there was great resistance, particularly within the Department of Health, if I remember rightly, to that, which is mm. why it hadn't happened. Um, yeah. So, well, I think, I think you were dead right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but failed miserably, so, you know. Well, you know, one day. One day. <laughs> well, look, guys, there's no more, there's no more questions. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming. Hope you got something out of it. Thanks to all the speakers again. Thanks to Anna. Sorry we had a few technical glitches along the way. Thanks to Anna. And um, if you wouldn't mind uh, switching, us, switching us all off, please, Anna.